Hello world, it's Birdo Prey 5, Cup Flop. Sometimes, sometimes you get an article. You just have to wake up at 3 a.m. and start ranting about. Because yes, I got this sent to me by a friend yesterday. And the rage, the rage started building. And I can only call this the sheer effing hubris of Michael Chabon. Now, Michael Chabon for those who don't know, was hired on as the showrunner for Star Trek Picard several episodes after Picard had already started filming, and he already left the show before Star Trek Picard came to air uh, or, or stream. Uh, so he, he, he had a very fleeting relationship with Star Trek Picard, but apparently he had a lot to say with it, because when he was there, he was the guy in charge. So he decided to answer some of the fan questions that have popped up over the first three episodes on his Instagram. And I have to commend him for the admirable uh, attempt to answer our questions. But I have to say, after seeing these answers, I almost wish he had just, you know, remained silent and gone off quietly into the night. But, uh, we get a rare sneak peek at supposedly why some of the decisions that were made were made. So this is an article from TrekCore.com. Uh, showrunner Michael Chabon answers the internet's burning Star Trek Picard fan questions. And actually, they did a, he did he because it was it wasn't an interview. This was just Michael Chabon on his Instagram taking some of the most frequently asked questions, I guess. And you know what? He, he, he did pick the correct ones. Aside from saying, why did you have to put Star Trek Discovery ships in? Which I think we all know the answer. Aside from that, these were probably my, my top gripes with the show. Unfortunately, he doesn't do it in the order in which it pisses me off the most. So we are going to skip around. Uh, but the first question... Uh, is about the sunglasses, and, and rightfully so. And the question is, what's the deal with Commodore's O's sunglasses? Everyone knows Vulcans have evolved an inner eyelid to protect them from the glare of their homeworld's three suns. I know Vulcan is a desert planet, it's a hot planet, and they have very bright sunlight. And yes, Vulcans have an inner eyelid, but even despite the inner eyelid, their eyes should be more capable of seeing in bright sunlight than a human's ever should. They're, they're stronger than humans. They have, you know, psychic abilities. They're just a different species. And yes, their eyes should be far better at seeing in, in bright sunlight than humans. In fact, Vulcans probably should have terrible night, uh, night vision and great uh, day vision on Earth. They shouldn't need sunglasses. Sunglasses should actually be a disadvantage to Vulcans, when you think about it. Uh, but what does Michael Chabon answer? He says, hmm, what therefore might we logically infer? No, he should have just said, my bad. Okay, Michael, the correct answer was, my bad. Instead, he goes on the spiel about how, uh, and it's later in the article, but uh, how that we we should assume that because she's Vulcan, she read uh, how uh, Star and see Starfleet intelligence or Starfleet security, how security forces on Earth have worked, and that typically you know FBI agents and whatnot they wear the dark glasses, and so she's wearing them because it's logical to do so do so on Earth, which is complete and utter bullcrap because we've been seeing Star Trek security, we've been seeing. Star Trek intelligence, we've been seeing, you know, the equivalents of the FBI, the CIA. Hell, we've seen Section 31 agents, both real and fake, in Star Trek for the last 50 years. Well, not Section 31, but you know what I'm saying. We've been seeing Star Trek people on screen for 50 years, and they don't wear sunglasses, even if they're in security. So you expect me to say that this Commodore was assigned to Earth, and picked up a book about 1980s police tactics and decided to base her look off of that. That makes zero sense, Michael. Zero sense. But this is basically 
this is the best quality we're going to get in terms of answers to our questions. And then, then somebody says, is Rafi vaping? Please tell me Rafi's not vaping. And Shaban says, Rafi is using a traditional Orion flash pipe known as a hork, uh, employed for centuries on their world to sublimate their fleshy tendrils of an intoxicant plant known as horks or snake leaf. And here, while well, he's trying to, to, trying to tell us that this is maybe, maybe not common on Earth, but it's common on Orion, and he's trying to explain away why Rafi is vaping, he instead opens up a whole new problem because we saw Rafi growing snake leaf at her, at her, you know, future trailer next to Vasquez Rocks. You know, what I really would have asked him is, how did she get a permit to build a house next to Vasquez Rocks? Uh, but he opens up a whole new door of bag of problems with this. So now we know that the snake leaf she is, she is growing isn't native to Earth. It wasn't like some jungle species that Earthlings found and then, you know, decided they could get high off of it that we haven't yet found. She's brought an alien plant to Earth and is growing it in her garden. So, like, even, even right now on Earth, when you move plants between continents, they be can become invasive and they can destroy local environments. I can only imagine that we would have some rules about not growing alien plants on different planets, because God knows what that would do to the natural plants on those planets. But, fine. Fine, so it's Orion. So we shouldn't get upset because Rafi is smoking an Orion vaping pen. Whatever. I don't, I don't care. I don't care. Okay, now this one really kind of bugs me. He says, what about Girardi's earbuds? Right? And you say, okay, sunglasses, but Girardi's earbuds, shouldn't those things be more futuristic? Yes, yes they should. He should have said that, yes. But here's what he said. He said, you know what? We actually thought about this a lot. And you know what? I believe him. I believe him that him and the Star Trek dis uh, Discovery, the Star Trek Picard writers sat in a room for probably three days and discussed what the earbuds should look like or what anything should look like. I believe him. When you're making a show that's set in the future, you have to ask yourself constantly how people will be meeting daily needs and performing everyday tasks. Or, Michael, you could look at the 700 plus episodes and 10 movies that came before you and, you know, you could get a hint as to how they accomplish everyday tasks, you know, just 20, 30 years before Star Trek Picard. Uh, you don't have to think too, too hard if you don't want to. But he says, our guiding principle is that some fundamental objects and tools Evolved to an ideal form. Efficient, economical, comfortable, durable, practical, effective, useful, and afterward change very little, except as subject to fashion, which itself is often retrospective. And you know what? I will grant him that. He is correct. And he goes on to, to give examples of books, paper books, right? If you just say books, I know I have more books in my Kindle than I have in my whole house books, wine bottles, and knives as examples. And he's right. To the outside person, the book has changed very little, the paper book. Uh, the wine bottle has changed very little. You know, kitchen knives have changed very little, although the metal gets sharper, the handles get sleeker. But yeah, a knife is a knife is a knife. Now, I worked in the liquor industry, so I can tell you that wine bottles and alcohol bottles in general are always improving. Uh, in fact, I was an engineer. One of my first projects, only one of my biggest projects, was a bottle of rum called Coyopa Rum, and it had an, an electronic label. It actually lit up and played music. It was super cool. It was super expensive to do in 2002, but you could do it in 2020 for probably a third the cost. And by, you know, 2050, there are going to be more than just liquor bottles that have light up labels. But granted, fine wines, their bottles probably aren't going to change to the outside. But I can assure you 
as an engineer, there are constant improvements being made to the glass, to the manufacturing, to the corks. Just just the, the total different numbers of corks. You have to understand the science that goes into corking a bottle. It is amazing. Uh, but yes, it's changing and it continues to change. But I will grant you from the outside, it's not supposed to look like it's changing. So, you know, I don't have a ton of problems with this. However, how dare, how dare he equate earbuds with paper books, wine bottles, and knives. Earbuds and just the way we listen to music has changed damn near infinitely in Michael Chabon's own life. In my own life, which is a lot shorter, I don't say a lot shorter, but shorter than Michael Chabon's life. Okay? When I was a kid, we had Sony Walkmans with those over-the-ear headphones. Not those big monstrosities that a lot of YouTubers wear with microphones. But these things were so cheap, airlines used to give them away for free. Just these headphones that go over your ear with a little piece of foam, and that was it. And it worked. You could hear the music. And over the last 30 years, we've gone from Walkmans to CD players to the first iPods to now our music is all on our phones. And our ear, our, our headphones have changed from basic to noise canceling to over the ear to now mostly earbuds that go in your ear. And yeah, they're improving. But to think that 2020 earbud technology has, has reached the same type of apex, its ideal form, uh, that, that wine bottles and knives have, that is, beyond absurd. We know in Star Trek canon, there are already universal translators that fit into your ear and can make you hear things that make it sound like anybody is speaking your language. So they already have miniature ear tech. They're not going to need earbuds. But again, this, this, is not, this is not the biggest problem. We will keep going. And, and so then there's another question about well, what about tobacco? What about Rios's tobacco habit? Habit. We know for sure about the future of Star Trek that humans have at least overcome their senses about this particularly unhealthy and obnoxious practice. And he's absolutely correct. Uh, there is a ton of evidence in in screen dialogue, in TNG, in DS9, and Voyager that smoking has been abandoned by humans. It's practically unheard of by the time of Voyager. So why is he smoking a cigar? Shaban says, oh, yes, but the thing about Rios, basically, is that he purposely, and he just, to, to summarize, he purposely keeps a lot of his outdated Latin American traditions. So basically, Shaban, oh, Shaban, Rios smokes a cigar because, I guess, you know, cigars come from Cuba and the Dominican Republic, and Rios is honoring his tradition, his history, by smoking a cigar, uh, which is absurd. And then Siobhan says, oh, would you, would you rather believe they were synthetic, synth cigars, you know, like synthahol? So they're synth cigars, so maybe, maybe they're not as toxic, but it's ridiculous. They shouldn't be smoking in Star Trek. Whatever. Michael, you, you want us to, to deal with it? That's fine. And I'm going to come back to this next one because it is by far the biggest and, and what has caused me to make a video at an ungodly hour of the morning. Uh, they even bring up, and i got to give some credit here, about how that one line in that one TNG episode with the Romulan defector, and he's talking to Data, and he says he knows a whole host of Romulan cyberneticists who would love to be this close to Data. And that seemed to completely contradict what Laris was saying about how Romulans hate cybernetic, how they hate AI, how Romulan computers uh, don't have artificial intelligence. They're just uh, numerical processors, which is ridiculous. 
this one scene. So they knew. They knew this scene existed. And they still chose to say that Romulans don't, don't practice AI. So we're supposed to believe that Romulans have cyberneticists only for the fact of destroying cybernetic life should somebody accidentally create it? I mean, it's ridiculous. He goes on to, to say that Romulan cyberneticists are like Nazi doctors. I'm, I'm not, I'm not even going to, not even going to comment past that. Then they bring up JL, and why is Rafi calling Picard JL? And they even bring it up in the comic book, which is good because uh, apparently I'm not the only one who read it. Uh, but the question is how can Rafi get away with referring to Jean Luc Picard as JL? The Picard we knew would never have allowed a subordinate to take a liberty like that. And Shaban says, true, but this is not the Picard we knew. Oh my god, mind blown, but wait, this is the comic book. This takes place before he resigned from Starfleet. This takes place before the Romulan sun, or the Hobus star, depending which, uh, which universe you believe, goes supernova, okay? This is before... Uh, Rafi gets fired. This is before he becomes a recluse on his vineyard. Okay, this is only several years after Star Trek Nemesis. He's accepted a promotion to Admiral. He is, for all practical purposes, supposed to be the Jean Luc we last saw in Nemesis. So, why is Rafi calling him JL at this point in time? He is supposed to be the Picard we knew in the Countdown comic. He has no answer. He just says, because this isn't the Picard you knew. Well, I would believe that if he did, if she didn't start calling him JL until after he resigned from Starfleet, right? It would make more sense. She's pissed at him. She's pissed at him after, because she gets fired because everybody hated her. And he was the only one keeping her employed at Starfleet. And how would you get under uh, Captain Picard or Admiral Picard or Jean-Luc Picard's skin? You would start calling him by his first name, or you would start calling him by some pet name you made up for him. And you wouldn't be able to get away with that while you were working under him. But the moment you got fired, now you call him JL to get under his skin, to piss him off. And there's nothing he can do about it. There's nothing he can do about it because he, he, he retired. He quit. And now he's not your superior officer. Now you can call him whatever the hell you want. So that would have made more sense. But it makes no sense. She's calling him JL while still his subordinate aboard the USS Verity in the Countdown comic that nobody will ever read and nobody will ever care about uh, six months from now. But this, this is the one. This is the one, the sheer fucking hubris of Michael Chabon. Smoking, vaping, snake weed, alcohol abuse, swear words. The Admiral Lady used the F word, Siobhan. What the F? And she wasn't the only one to use the F word, mind you. And Michael Siobhan says, listen, listen. He's going he's gonna to tell us a story. No human society will every be perfect. You see what he did there? He said every, even though he meant ever. But that, that, that was a joke. No human society will ever be perfect. I get it. No human society will ever be perfect. Because no human will be perfect. The most we can do, and as Star Trek ever reminds us must do, is aspire to perfection and work to make it so. And another joke, make it so. Nor can Fu can perfect them, as a wise Yang once said. And there... He's showing us his Star Trek cred because he watched the TOS episode uh, with the Yangs and the whatever the hells. The, the, the lost United States early Americans with a copy of the Constitution they didn't understand how to read. A uh, great scene from the original series, but really one of those episodes you just have to kind of ignore in the, the greater good of Star Trek canon. 
Anyway, he goes on to say, until that impossible day, shit is going to continue to happen. And when it does, humans are going to want to swear. The absence of swear words in Star Trek was never, 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 never has a meaning, Michael, never means something, was never a matter of Federation principle. It was a matter of FCC rules. You stupid son of a bitch. Writers of previous eras had no choice. They were censored. Swearing is one of humanity's most ancient, sensible, and reliable constellations. Personally, I would consider any society that discouraged, banned, or abandoned the use of curse words to be a fucking dystopia. You stupid motherfucking a-hole, Michael Shaban, and I assume you must take that as a compliment. First off, we discourage swearing right now, okay? Swearing is discouraged. It's discouraged on YouTube. It's discouraged on TV. It's hopefully discouraged uh, at home. I hope your father discouraged you from swearing when you were a kid. I hope your mother did too, assuming uh, you know you knew your mother. I know you knew your father because of the article in the New Yorker. So that's why I went to father. It's not patriarchy. It's just I'm, I knew you knew him. Uh, you know, yes. So swearing is discouraged right effing now. So why would that be a problem? Why would it be a dystopia to discourage it? Now, if it was banned, yes, that would be a dystopia, right? I mean, we've all, we all saw Demolition Man, uh, one of my favorite futuristic movies of a futuristic dystopia where You've been fined two credits for a violation of the verbal code, right? And he has to just curse into, uh, curse up a storm so he gets enough paper to use his toilet paper because he doesn't want to use the sheet, the seashells. So yes, I will grant you that if they were banned, that would be a dystopia. But abandoned? No, abandoned doesn't make it a dystopia. Abandoned means we got one little step closer to the perfect society we will never obtain, okay? We will never attain a perfect society, but we can do better than we're doing right now. And yes, in 1960s, they could not swear on television. Hell, you could not swear on television, network television today. You could not drop the F-bomb if Star Trek Picard was airing on CBS, uh, the TV station, instead of CBS all access. So he's almost he's almost viewing this that it was his right that he's doing this as a way of fighting the censors that that's why he put in the f word. I say it's lazy. I also say the sheer fucking hubris of him to attempt to tell us that it was never a, a principle of the federation. Did he not see Star Trek 4? Okay? All of half of Star Trek 4 was jokes between Spock and Kirk and, and you know, interactions with, uh, you know, 1980s people. And, you know, Spock's like, why, uh, Admiral, your use of language has altered since we've landed. Uh, your use of, shall we say, colorful metaphors. And, and Kirk's like, well, that's just the way these people speak. No one takes you seriously unless you swear every other word. You'll, you'll find it in all the literature of the time. And, and, you know, double dumbass on you is the worst word Captain Kirk could think of. So don't tell me that it was never a principle of the Federation. In Star Trek IV, it was most certainly a principle of the Federation that humans had given up most swear words. And yes, the FCC might, might censor uh, television on the air. But they had options. They could bleep things out. They could have used some words instead of others. They could have gone the way of Battlestar Galactica and came up with their own word, right? They could have came up with their own version of frack. They could have said frick. Because curse words change over time. If you've ever seen HBO's Deadwood, there was a certain word that begins with a C and ends in sucker that they use six times a minute. And that word was never used 
in the 1800s in Deadwood. That was not, that was not the, in the vernacular. Uh, the actual word that they used at that time would have gathered laughs today. So they made the decision to change it out for, for C blank sucker instead of, you know, the word they would have really used. So you could certainly have come up with a future curse word if that was your intention. But no, it was not the intention. The intention was to show humans didn't curse much in the future, if at all. And the FCC doesn't control what people say in movies. They could have cursed in the movies if they wanted to, but they didn't. They, the worst they went with was double dumbass on you until Star Trek Generations, where Data says, shit, one time for laughs. Other than that, in all the other Star Trek movies, no F-bombs, no A-holes, no C-suckers, nothing. Just, just, just double dumbass on you, and holy shit. Were they being censored too, Michael? No, they were not being censored. You know they weren't being censored. I know they weren't being censored. I used to think Michael Chabon was going to be somebody who was going to help Star Trek Picard be better than a certain previous Star Trek uh, by Alex Kurtzman ever was. Uh, but then when I saw the short track that Michael Chabon wrote, Q&A, and we saw he had Spock singing show tunes in a turbo lift with number one, uh, it, was, it was like a big, big warning slapped upside my face. Uh, yeah, it, this, he's not, I knew then Michael Chabon was not going to be the savior of Star Trek. And I guess they realized it too, because like I said, before Picard even came to air, Michael Chabon was off the project. I don't know who needs to come in. Uh, there have been rumors. Unfortunately, I suspect they are only rumors, but we need a new direction in Star Trek. Clearly, Michael Chabon was not it. However, Michael, in the unlikely chance you ever actually see this video. I do have to give credit where credit is due. I do want to thank you for answering fans. You certainly didn't have to. Uh, it's not your job anymore. And even if it was, it's not something anyone ever has to do. I appreciate you giving us some look into why some of the decisions that were made were made. And I earnestly wish you luck in the future on your non-Star Trek projects. I really do. I really do. And for everyone else, you know, if you've seen my previous reviews, I am not yet decided on Star Trek Picard. I'm not saying Star Trek Picard is a terrible show. I quite like the first three episodes. Uh, there are problems, yes. But right now, and this is the day before the fourth episode comes out, I'd say I still like Star Trek Picard. I enjoy Star Trek Picard. I look forward to Star Trek Picard. But I do all these things despite the sunglasses, despite the earbuds, despite the smoking, despite the snake leaf, despite the vaping, and despite the swearing. Everybody talks. Everybody, the, the, the actors themselves, if you see their interviews where they talk about Star Trek and like they all remember watching Star Trek as kids with their family. And, and this is the same thing for CBS. CBS All Access also rebooted the Twilight Zone. Jordan Peele does the Twilight Zone and the, uh, the characters in the Twilight Zone, uh, even say that they remember watching the Twilight Zone with their families when they were four, five, six years old. And, and the, the actors on Star Trek remember watching Star Trek as children because it was something you could bond with. It was something families could bond over and watch Star Trek together. There was stuff for the adults. There was stuff for the children. But now, Michael, as some ridiculous quest against censorship, you've decided to throw in F-bombs and other naughty words. How in good conscience could somebody watch Star Trek Picard with their four, five, or six-year-old? 
I mean, maybe your 14 year old, you know, he's heard worse, I'm sure. Nobody's going to pretend that he didn't. But come on. Come on, Michael. There are people who remember watching Star Trek with them when they were just children. Little children should not be hearing the words you're using. You didn't have to use them. That's the thing. You didn't have to use them. We've had 50 years of Star Trek proving you can do good, great, excellent Star Trek without dropping an F-bomb even once. Even once. It's very upset. But, again, Michael, thank you for answering these questions. I don't like a lot of your answers, but at least you did it. Bravo. And, I, again, I wish you luck in your future non-Star Trek projects. Please live long and prosper. And Kapla all. Take care.